All right, and in here, let's take our Bibles, please. We're going to turn to 2 Kings chapter 11. 2 Kings chapter number 11. And uh, for sake of a little bit of commentary, let's go back to chapter 8, please, and then chapter 9 as well. <clears throat> I know there are a lot of names and families to keep up with uh, in these stories, especially if they're uh, lesser-known families, lesser-known names. Um, so I, I try to keep everything in context, make it um, easy for us to remember who's who uh, as we're studying. Part of the confusion is this, that in Israel... There was a king Jehoram or Joram, and in Judah there was a king Jehoram or Joram. Well, we're going to see another king where there is a uh, one with the same name, and that is the name Jehoash, or shorter for that, you may know better than Jehoash, is Joash. There's a Joash in Israel, there's a Joash in Judah. And so it's very important to keep them sorted out as you study through the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. Uh, let's look at 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 23, just again to set the context for which king we're going to be studying today. 2 Kings 8, 23, it says, And the rest of the acts of Joram, that's Jehoram, and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Joram slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, and Ahaziah his son reigned in his stead. So Jehoram king of Judah dies and Ahaziah his son is now the king. Verse 25, in the twelfth year of Joram the son of Ahab king of Israel did Ahaziah the son of Jehoram king of Judah begin to reign. Two and twenty years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign and he reigned one year in Jerusalem and his mother's name was Athaliah. Now, Athaliah is the name that we need to know for today's chapter, Athaliah. So uh, here you have Ahaziah. He begins to reign. He only reigns for one year. His mother's name is Athaliah. She's the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. Now, verse 26 says it fairly plainly that she is the daughter of whom? Of Omri, it says, king of Israel. Uh, verse 27 says, And he walked in the way of the house of Ahab, and did evil in the sight of the Lord as did the house of Ahab, for he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. And he went with Joram, the son of Ahab, to the war against Hazel, king of Syria, in Ramoth-Gilead. And the Syrians wounded Joram. And king Joram went back to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him at Ramah when he fought against Hazel, king of Syria. And Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahab in Jezreel, because he was sick. And by the way, you may, may wonder, you know, why didn't they just use last names? Wouldn't that have been a whole lot easier than it was this person was the son of this person was the son of this person? Well, again, we think in structures of families, and we should, but, but there were some strange goings on with the way families mixed and mingled. And so you have to trace it by, well, it was the son of this person or the son of that person or the son of that person. Very important that the Bible words it the way it does. Um, and right here it says, notice that Athaliah, or we're not to Athaliah yet, I'm sorry. It says that Ahab, uh, his mother's name was Athaliah, yes, verse 26, the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. So right here it says that his mother's name, Ahaziah's mother's name was Athaliah, and she, Athaliah, is the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. Well, Omri had a son as well. And who was Omri's son? It was Ahab. Now, the Bible says, the Bible says that Ahab and Athaliah were brother and sister. Now, they might have been half brother, half sister, you know, half brother, half sister, but that's what the Bible says. Now, if you go to commentaries, do you know what commentaries say? They, they say something completely different. So am I going to trust a commentary or am I going to trust what the Bible plainly says? I'm going to trust what the Bible plainly says. Okay? And what that does, if, we, if you trace down what's going on there, uh, well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let, let me get, let go back to where I'm at. Uh, verse 
29 says, King Joram went back to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him at Ramah. When he fought against Haziel, king of Syria, and Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahab, in Jezreel because he was sick. And then remember that God had called Jehu uh, to go destroy all the house of Ahab. And because Ahaziah is confederate and he's there with Jehoram, he also is slain. So look in chapter 9, verse 16. It says, so Jehu, remember Jehu was called to go destroy all the house of Ahab. So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel. For Joram lay there and Ahaziah, king of Judah, was come down to see Joram. Now again, I know there's a ton of names here to keep up with. I know this. But remember, go, if you look back, who is Ahaziah's mother? Ahaziah's mother is Athaliah. Athaliah is the sister of Ahab. Now, it might be half-sister, but she's a sister, and she's the daughter of Omri, like Ahab is the son of Omri. Okay, remember that. So, uh, because Ahaziah is with Jehoram, king of Israel, he also is under the judgment of God. Jehu slays uh, Jehoram. In fact, look down in verse 20 of 2 Kings 9. It says, And the watchmen told, saying, He came, they had sent out, uh, horse, horsemen to uh, messengers to see, hey, is this person who's coming, are they coming for peaceful reasons? And the watchman, verse 20, told, saying, He came even unto them, and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. And Joram said, Make ready. And his chariot was made ready. And Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot, and they went out against Jehu, and met him in the portion of Naboth the Jezreelite. And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. And Joram turned his hands and fled. So the king of Israel, Joram, turns his hands and, fl and is fleeing and says to Ahaziah, king of Judah, There is treachery, O Ahaziah. And Jehu, the actual now newly minted king of Israel, drew a bow with his full strength and smote Jehoram between his arms. And the arrow went out at his heart and he sunk down in his chariot. So Jehu slays the king of Israel. And Jehu is the king of Israel now. And he's been anointed already. He slays Jehoram. Well, there Ahaziah is with Jehoram. Look down in verse 27. It says, but when Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this, he fled by the way of the garden house, and Jehu followed after him and said, Smite him also in the chariot. And they did so at the going up to Gur, which is by Ableam, and he fled to Megiddo and died there. So here uh, you, have, uh, you have Jehoram slain. You have uh, Ahaziah slain. Now let's begin our chapter this week, 2 Kings chapter 11, verse 1. It says, And when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead. What did she do? She mourned, she weeps? No. She arose and destroyed all the seed royal. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please speak to our hearts, Lord. I know there's a lot of facts and figures and information to digest here. Lord, help us to do it, Lord, and teach us from your word this morning, Lord. I pray that we'll yield to you whatever you show to us. You know the needs in this room and every heart. So please meet those needs through your word as you promised you would. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Athaliah is the mother of Ahaziah. Ahaziah has been slain by Jehu. She sees that her son is dead. What does she do? She gets up and destroys the rest of the lineage of the king of Judah. Um, in fact, she's slaying her own grandsons here. She's slaying her own family. Um, she wants power. She is Ahab's sister. She's the daughter of Omri. Her name, Athaliah, means whom Jehovah has afflicted. And if you trace down, again, if you believe the commentaries, then you'd say, well, she's, she is the, the granddaughter of Ahab. But if you follow what the Bible actually says, what the Bible actually says is she's the daughter of Omri. And so if you trace all of that down, what that means then is this, that her son, Ahaziah, that has just been slain, is a product of her union physically with her niece's husband. So you say, well, this, you know, again, we just think in terms of structure, and we should. That's God's, God's plan is simple. 
You know, God's plan is one man, one woman for a lifetime. That's God's plan. And by the way, God says that he hates putting away. Uh, who, who should you be focused on? You should be focused on the spouse you have right now. Your best opportunity for marital happiness is with the spouse you have right now. God's plan, one man, one woman, a lifetime. So we think in those structures because that is God's plan. But here you have, uh, you have a situation where this woman is a wicked woman. Uh, again, she has evidently, based on what we read in Scripture, had a union with her niece's husband, King Joram of Judah. And that has produced Ahaziah, who is the king who was just slain. So when Athaliah sees that Ahaziah has been slain, she says, you know what? I might as well be queen. I'm going to kill the rest of them. And that's what she does, or she thinks she does. And so verse 1 says, When Athaliah's mother, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all, or at least she thought all, the seed royal. Now, why couldn't she destroy all the seed royal? Because God had made a promise. Uh, go back to 2 Samuel chapter 7. And let's remember this promise. 2 Samuel chapter 7, God had made a promise to David. Now, uh, did it ever happen in the nation of Judah where someone from David's lineage did not sit on the throne? Well, it did when Judah ceased to be a nation. But the lineage was still there leading all the way down to the Son of God being born, Jesus Christ. See, again, we must remember, a lot of folks have their fixation on the modern-day nation of Israel as if that is, that, you know, that's God's fulfillment of his promises. Folks, I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of God's promises. Jesus Christ will rule and reign literally from Jerusalem. He is the fulfillment of God's promises. And I'm not going to take the time to peel back all the layers of that. We've done it many a time before. But remember the promise made here to David. 2 Samuel 7, we call it the Davidic covenant. It just simply means it's a promise made to David. 2 Samuel 7, verse 16, he says to David, in thine house, remember David had wanted to build a house for the Lord and uh, Nathan the prophet came and, and uh, he, he said, uh, go, you know, Nathan said, go ahead, do whatever's in your heart. And God told him, no, Nathan, go back and tell him you're not going to build the temple. You've been a bloody man. You've been a man of war. Uh, instead, your son will build it. He'll be a man of peace. I'll give him peace. But then God makes David a promise. David wanted to build God a house, and God said, David, I have something for you. David, I'm going to build your house. He didn't mean a physical structure. He meant his household, his family. And see what he says in 2 Samuel 7, 16. He says, in thine house and thy kingdom, thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. In fact, read in the Psalms, that's where the people get confused when there is no longer a descendant of David on the throne of Judah. They say, God, you broke your covenant. You broke your promise. He says, no, I didn't. I didn't break my promise. And he did not break his promise. That is fulfilled through Jesus Christ. That's how it's fulfilled. So again, by the way, that's a big key to understanding in prophecy. If you'll just get that one key, it's, it simplifies so much, but it's absolutely the key that most of those things that are promised are fulfilled through Jesus Christ. So uh, anyway, uh, go back. So why couldn't she destroy all of the seed royal? Because there had to be some seed left for Jesus Christ one day to be born of the seed of David. And so go back to 2 Kings 11. Athaliah thinks she has slain all of the seed royal, but there's one that has been saved. And notice who it is, verse 2. And again, here are more names to sort through and understand. We're going to have a couple of chapters to learn these names, so it's okay. If you don't, if you don't get them all right now, I, I'd encourage you to go back home and read these chapters over a few times until you do understand them. Uh, there are a lot of names to sort through. But here's an important name. It says, but Jehosheba the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah. So, so get, this, get this settled in your mind who this is. King Jehoram died and his son Ahaziah reigned and then Ahaziah has just been slain by Jehu. Well, this lady, Jehosheba, is the daughter of King Joram who died. She's the brother of Ahaziah that was just killed by Jehu. She took Joash. Joash is the son of Ahaziah and stole him from among the king's sons which were slain. He's just an infant at this time. He's an infant. 
she steals him from among the king's sons which were slain. And by the way, it's important also to understand this side of the story. If you look at 2 Chronicles, we won't turn there today, but this parallel passage is in 2 Chronicles 22. She is also the wife of Jehoiada the priest. Now, I'll, I'll jump to the end of the story to help clarify, and then we'll fill in the gaps in the middle. But Jehoiada the priest and Jehosheba are the ones who raised Joash. Jehoiada the priest and Jehosheba are the ones who not only are they hiding Joash, but they're raising him, they're teaching him what's right, they're teaching him how to follow God, they help lead a revival in Judah. And by the way, remember that because many years later, Joash is very disloyal to them. And we'll see that in a few chapters many years later. But here's this little infant Joash, Athaliah rises up, she thinks she destroys all the seed royal, but Jehosheba, who's the daughter of King Joram, she's the sister of Ahaziah, she's the wife of Jehoiada the priest, she took Joash, which is her nephew, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons which were slain. She's hiding him from his wicked grandmother, who is Athaliah, who has destroyed all the seed royal except for him because he's been hidden. Notice, and they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah so that he was not slain. So this brave, godly lady, the, the wife of Jehoiada the priest, she hides Joash. Or again, another way to say the name is Jehoash, same person. Now again, there's a Joash of Judah. He's the Joash of Judah. Jehoash, same person of Judah. Verse 3, And he was with her, hid in the house of the Lord, six years and Athaliah did reign over the land uh, it's interesting uh, go to go to Psalm 27 he is hiding all this time as a child in the house of the Lord I do wonder this I wonder if Athaliah had spent more time in the house of the Lord if she had found him <laughs> I wonder that uh, you know Psalm 27 says this verse 1 and think about Joash's life and how literally true this is. Now, it's true for us spiritually as well. But I mean physically, for his physical safety, the verses we're about to read are true for Joash. Look at Psalm 27, 1. It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies, and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. Uh, Joash is literally hiding in the temple of the Lord. He's being raised by Jehoiada and Jehosheba, his godly wife. And uh, notice uh, Psalm 84. Saw Jehoiada's godly wife, Jehosheba. Look at Psalm 84, verses 1 through 4. Psalm 84, look at verses 1 through 4. There's this statement that, that is around, it's been around, it's nothing new. But, you know, let me, let me say it like this. Um, I'm middle-aged. When I grew up, I was playing sports. I never, never played a sport as a child on a Sunday. Never had a game scheduled for a Sunday. Never had a practice scheduled for a Sunday. It wasn't until I moved down here 26 years ago I didn't, I didn't know people did that on Sunday, that there were practices on Sunday and there were games on Sunday. And how many parents or how many people miss church because they've prioritized sports or stuff of this world instead of God's house? The, the very fact our culture doesn't think it's a big deal shows how far we've fallen. It does. Um, there was a day that, that's just unheard of. Now it's the norm. Now it's the norm. It ought not be for God's people. It ought not be for God's people. Um, by the way, I say this. When we went through 
uh, the whole, whole pandemic thing and, and they were trying to shut churches down and we still had church. I'm thankful for that. Thankful we still had church. I'm not against our, today's YouTube Sunday. I'm not against our YouTube channel. I'm for it. It's a great tool. But it does not replace assembling with the people of God. Hebrews 10.25 still says, still says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the what? More as you see the day approaching. Not less, more. What day? When Jesus returns. We ought to be gathering more and more and more together, not less and less. Not finding ways to meet less. We ought to be finding ways to meet more. And the Bible says that the purpose of meeting is to exhort one another. I've heard people say, I don't need to go to church to worship God. You're exactly right. And that people say, I can worship God anywhere. You're exactly right. And you should worship God everywhere, including church. But according to Hebrews 10, 25, that's not even the main purpose of gathering together. What's the main purpose of gathering together? Exhorting one another. What's exhorting one another? It's, it's lifting up, encouraging, emboldening one another, supporting one another. And again, I've said this numerous times. Let's pretend you don't need anybody else's encouragement. Let's pretend that. Okay, That's not true, but let's pretend that somebody else needs your encouragement. Somebody else needs your encouragement. Did you know just by being at church, you encourage other believers? How many of you believe that? How many? Yeah, absolutely. How, why do we believe that? Because we know what it is to look around and see someone who's there and that encourages us. And we also know when somebody's missing how that we wonder and we worry and we pray and go, are they okay? Right? So there's a reason we should be exhorting one another. There's a reason we should be gathering together rather, and that's to exhort one another. And we ought to be doing it more and more and more. Um, be careful again about this mindset of, well, we don't need church. We don't need church. We do need church. God's word tells us to assemble. Uh, Psalm 84, notice verse 1, it says, How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee, Selah. Joash is literally dwelling in the house. He's dwelling in the temple. Now again, yes, I know our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, but we're still commanded in this day and age, we're commanded to assemble together. And I know I'm preaching to the choir. We're all here today. And I know there are folks who would like to be here and cannot be. But the point is this, we ought to give our all to assemble with God's people. Uh, I, I've heard many a person, and, I, and there are times, I get this, there are times you're ill, there are times that you have to stay home. I've, I've missed times myself when I was flat on my back a year and a half ago, two, two years ago. But that ought not to be the norm. We ought to be looking for reason to be here, not for reason not to be here, this is the point. So notice 2 Kings 11, uh, go back to verse 3. He, Joash, was hid, uh, was with her, with Jehoshaphat and Jehoiada, hid in the house of the Lord six years, and Athaliah did reign over the land. And the seventh year Jehoiada sent and fetched the rulers over hundreds, with the captains and the guard. Now understand, again, you can read this in 2 Chronicles 23, which is also a parallel passage, uh, that the guard, we're talking about Levites. They're the temple guard. And one of the terms the Bible would use as well is porters. They keep the door. Well, they're not there just to be friendly and open the door. They're there to guard. They're there to keep the door. They're gatekeepers. And so uh, in the seventh year, Jehoiada, the priest, he, and this is Jehoshaphat's husband, uh, and this is the uncle to Joash, sent and fetched the rulers over hundreds with the captains and the guard and brought them to him into the house of the Lord and made a covenant with them and took an oath of them in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. To this point, these folks did not know that Joash lived. They didn't know there was one of the sons of the king still alive. And he commanded them saying, this is the thing that ye shall do. A third part of you that enter in on the Sabbath shall even be keepers of the watch of the king's house. 
And a third part shall be at the gate of Sur, and a third part at the gate behind the guard. So shall ye keep the watch of the house, that it be not broken down. And two parts of all you that go forth on the Sabbath, even they shall keep the watch of the house of the Lord about the king. So here's what he's saying. When you're dismissed from your course, which is basically their shift, when your shift is over, it's going to look like you're exiting, but you're not. You're setting up a perimeter. You're going to guard. You're going to stay here. I'm going to give you weapons. You're going to stay. None of you are going to be dismissed. We're going to do this at the changing of the guard, so there'll be a, a lot more people here. We're going to set up a perimeter around the king. We're going to protect him. Notice verse 8. And ye shall compass the king round about. You're going to be all around him, every man with his weapons in his hand. And that reminds me again, as I said not long ago, guns are not the problem. Weapons are not the problem. It's the people, the hearts of people holding weapons. We need good guys with guns. I'll say it again. We need good guys with guns. We do. Uh, you know, so let's make a law to limit guns. All you do then is, is put, is, the criminals are still going to have guns. They're not, they're not obeying the law now. So you make another law and the criminals are going to keep having guns and then good law-abiding citizens won't have what they need to protect themselves. Um, well, supposedly anyway. <laughs> uh, ye shall compass the king round about every man with his weapons in his hand, and he that cometh within the ranges let him be slain, and be ye with the king as he goeth out and as he cometh in. And the captains over the hundreds did according to all things that Jehoiada the priest commanded. And they took every man his men that were to come in on the Sabbath with them that should go out on the Sabbath and came to Jehoiada the priest. So again, there's a new shift coming in. There's a shift that was supposed to go out. They didn't leave. They stayed there to provide extra guard. Verse 10. And to the captains over hundreds did the priests give King David spears and shields that were in the temple of the Lord. And the guard stood every man with his weapons in his hand round about the king from the right corner of the temple to the left corner of the temple, along by the altar and the temple. And he brought forth the king's son, Joash, and put the crown upon him, and gave him the testimony, and they made him king, and anointed him, and they clapped their hands, and said, God save the king. There's one word I want to define here in verse 12. What is the testimony? So they put the crown on his head, they anoint him with oil, they clap their hands, God saved the king, but they also gave him the testimony. Well, what's the testimony? If you go to Exodus, look at Exodus chapter 16. I want you to see very simply that the testimony are the words of God. They're the law of God as given to Moses. And look at Exodus 16, verse 34. So, you know, we in our nation have a, a ritual and I would hope, I wish it were more than just a ritual. We have a ritual whereby most presidents would uh, put their hand upon a Bible and swear on a Bible to uphold the Constitution. And for many, it's just a show. It's just a ritual. You know, right here, there, there's this ritual. The ritual is there for a purpose. Folks, and, and look at the history of our, our land. Uh, Blackstone's laws were made up primarily of what? Scripture, Scripture. I mean, our, our uh, laws of our land were based on Scripture. Don't tell me we didn't start as a God-fearing nation. We did. I mean, the very first legal document, the Mayflower, Flower Compact, Pat, bleh, the Mayflower Compact. Time out. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you for that. The very first line says, In the name of God, Amen. I mean, that's the very first line. Our nation was founded upon God's law. It was founded upon God's word. Um, here, they were to give the king the testimony, the law of God. Look at Exodus 16, verse 34. It says, As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. And then look at uh, Exodus 25. If you would, you can read the... the um, context of that passage Exodus 25 verse 21 it says and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee remember in Psalm 119 Psalm 119 is all about what somebody tell me it's the longest chapter in the Bible it's all about what the Bible 
And one of the terms for the scripture is God's testimonies, right? So when he's talking about giving the king the testimony, he gave him the law of God, the word of God. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Before the children of Israel or Judah ever had a king, God prepared them for these days and he told them, when you have a king, the day's coming, you're going to ask for a king, you want to be like all the other nations. When you do have a king, he gives him a lot of instructions. Don't multiply horses unto himself. Don't multiply wives. He tells him all these different things not to do and to do. Notice one of the keys he tells him here, Deuteronomy 17, verse 18. Deuteronomy 17, 18, it says, And it shall be when he, the king, sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law. Look, he didn't just say, go buy one at the bookstore. He said, I want him to literally write his own copy. By the way, this is, this is a truth. When it comes to studying, this little thing right here will help you immensely when it comes to studying the Bible. Uh, as you read the Bible, jot down thoughts, jot down notes, underline things. As God speaks to your heart, there's, there's, just, there's an amazing connection between when God gives you something in your heart and your mind and when you put it down on paper, when you, when you, when you put it down with a pen. I'm, I'm telling you, so I have trouble understanding the Bible. Get one of these and use this in your Bible study. He said for the king, he said, it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law. You have trouble memorizing scripture? Write that verse out over and over and over again. Write it out. Notice, he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. Notice, and it shall be with him, writing it was not the end. It shall be with him. Uh, we shouldn't have to find our Bible. Does that make sense? We ought to know right where it is. Now look, I, I know every one of us probably at some point you were at church and you set it down somewhere. I, I get that. But you understand what I'm saying. Well, you, you understand what I'm saying. I'm saying we, we should not have to go sort through the closet to find our Bible. You know, pull up the, the magazines and the TV remote to find where we left our Bible before last Sunday. You know, it shall be with them, notice, and he shall read therein, what's the next word? All the days of his life. Uh, the Bible says we're to pray, give us this day our daily bread. We are to pray for physical bread, but we're also, we need spiritual food every day, every day. He shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God. And then notice, to keep all the words of this law. The purpose of learning them is to keep them, to do them. Not just to know them, not just to have them rehearsed, but to live by them to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. And then notice the effect of reading the scriptures well. It'll keep you humble. Verse 20, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren and that he turn not aside from the commandment. It'll keep you obedient to the right hand or to the left. This book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. It's true. Notice to the end, what's the purpose? that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. God promised blessing if we will study his word, read it, and obey it. Well, here, back in 2 Kings chapter 11, they all gather around Joash. They put a guard around him. Uh, the Bible says, verse 11, the guard stood. Chapter 11, verse 11, the guard stood, every man with his weapons in his hand. Round about the king from the right corner of the temple to the left corner of the temple, along by the altar in the temple. And he brought forth the king's son and put the crown upon him and gave him the testimony. And they made him king and anointed him. And they clapped their hands and said, God save the king. And when Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she came to the people into the temple of the Lord. And when she looked, behold, the king stood by a pillar as the manner was, and the princes and the trumpeters by the king. And all the people of the land rejoiced and blew with trumpets. And Athaliah rent her clothes and cried, Treason, treason. Now remember this. How could she say treason? I mean, she slaughtered all of her grandchildren to take this position. She's the queen by being wicked. Remember, in her mind, she thinks she's destroyed all the seed royal. So in her mind, she has a right to the throne. Nobody else does. 
But listen, God deals with the wicked in this way. Job 5.13 says, He taketh God, taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And the counsel of the froward is carried headlong. Athli didn't know that anyone of David's line had survived her murderous rampage. Look at Psalm 18. Psalm 18, verse 25. It's very important to understand how God deals with mankind. Psalm 18, verse 25 says, With the merciful, thou, God, wilt show thyself merciful. With an upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the froward, thou wilt show thyself froward. For thou wilt save the afflicted people, but wilt bring down high looks. Athaliah thought she'd figured it out. She thought she had slain everybody, that she was queen for life. She didn't know the whole time. There was a king growing. There was a king being trained. There was a king being protected and hidden. Joash, this young man. Look at verse 15 of chapter 11. It says, But Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of the hundreds, the officers of the host, and said unto them, Have her forth without the ranges, and him that followeth her kill with the sword. For the priest had said, Let her not be slain in the house of the Lord. And they laid hands on her, and she went by the way by the which the horses came into the king's house, and there was she slain. And Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people, that they should be the Lord's people between the king also and the people. And all the people of the land went into the house of Baal and break it down, his altars and his images, break they in pieces thoroughly, and slew Matin, the priest of Baal, before the altars, and the priest appointed officers over the house of the Lord. And he took the rulers over hundreds, and the captains and the guard and all the people of the land, and they brought down the king from the house of the Lord and came by the way of the gate of the guard to the king's house, and he sat on the throne of the kings. This little seven-year-old boy is king, Joash. Now, obviously, you say, how, how could a seven-year-old rule and reign? Well, as we'll study the next couple of chapters, we'll see. Until he was of age, it was Jehoiada gar- guiding him and guarding him. And Jehoiada was making the decisions. At this point, Joash is a figurehead, but he's obedient. He's obedient to Jehoiada. But the time will come while uh, Joash is still a young man. That he will grow up and in his own right he will begin to do those things which are right for his nation. Notice verse 20, it says, And all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was in quiet, and they slew Athaliah with the sword beside the king's house. Proverbs 11.10 says, When it goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoiceth. And when the wicked perish, there is shouting. They were rejoicing because they were no longer under the wicked rule of Queen Athaliah. Verse 21, seven years old was Jehoash, same as Joash, same person, when he began to reign. Next week, uh, chapter 12, we'll notice that uh, Joash grows up a little bit, comes, uh, begins to make decisions on his own to do that which is right. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Bless it to our hearts. Again, I pray that we'll remember what we've studied today, that you'll apply to our hearts these truths that we'll obey whatever you've shown to us today that we'll yield. And Lord, I pray for the next hour, if there be someone here that's lost, may they trust you as Savior today. In Jesus' name, amen.